Hello, and uh, welcome to Stanford's CARES monthly community talk series. My name is uh, Meenal Mahari. I'm occupational medicine physician and director for nutrition for Stanford CARE. Um, I'm really pleased to bring you this series of talk co-sponsored by Stanford Health Library and Vincent C. Wu Foundation. I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Anak Trivedi, who will be speaking on caring for family members with chronic or serious illness, roles, challenges, and coping. Dr. Ranak Trivedi is a clinical health psychologist and assistant professor in Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, Stanford University, and an investigator at the Center for Innovation to Implementation at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System. Her NIH, VA, and foundation-funded studies are focused on improving the self-management of serious illnesses by enhancing the collaboration and coping of patients and their caregivers. Dr. Trivedi is a surgeon scholars leader, and she is using this platform to improve culturally concordant care for South Asian women with breast cancer and their caregivers. Dr. Trivedi serves as director for training and education at the Center for Innovation to Implementation at the VA Palo Alto Healthcare System, Site PI, and training director for Elizabeth <clears throat> Dole National Center for Excellence of Veteran and Caregiver Research and the Director for, of Caregiving and Family Systems at the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education Care. She envisions a culturally concordant healthcare system attuned to both the patients and their caregivers. Here is Dr. Trivedi. Thank you so much, Dr. Maharir, and thank you, Stanford Care and the, and the Wu Foundation for supporting this series, and thanks all of you for taking the time out so late in the evening to uh, to attend this presentation. I'm just gonna take a second to share my slides. So um, as uh, you all know, um, I we, we're here to talk about caring for family members with chronic or serious illnesses, um, the roles and challenges and coping. And I want to start off by saying that November is National Family Caregiver Month. So this is why this topic is really relevant for for this particular month and it'll allow us to have a conversation about how in the Asian context, this, these things seem to manifest. I have no financial conflicts of interest to declare for this presentation. I want to start off by telling you a little bit, and you probably already know this, but just to review what are chronic and serious illnesses. And chronic illnesses are those that are last a year or more. So we all know what those conditions, some of them look like, there's hypertension, uh, breast cancer can be included in that, uh, depression, uh, they're all conditions that can last a year or more. And those are chronic conditions. And these are US data, but I think it's important for us to anchor ourselves into how common these conditions are. In the United States, uh, there's 59% of adults uh, who have at least one chronic condition. And that is the figure to your left over here, 28%, so about one in three have three or more chronic conditions, and 12% have five or more chronic conditions. And what's st striking about this is that 90% of our healthcare spending in the United States is for managing chronic conditions. So this is a pretty big deal when you think at the society level. But let's talk about Asia, which is something that I think is relevant to all of us who are on this call. Asia is, of course, a very big area that we're talking about. It's an entire continent that comprises 48 countries with 71 official languages, and it covers 17 million square miles. And yet a lot of times we wind up lumping people into the Asian category, even though that's two thirds of the world's population. And I think this is important for all of us who are navigating the healthcare system to keep in mind that when we're talking about Asian health, anything, we're really talking an extremely heterogeneous and diverse group of people. And this is what it looks like. These are just some pictures of uh, people who, uh, all of whom have Asian backgrounds. So you can see the amount of diversity that, our, that the Asian diaspora or Asian natives bring to our world. And yet there are certain commonalities. So these are the deadliest conditions across South Asian countries, which are these seven countries. And you can see the ones that are bolded are the most common, are the common across all the groups. 
And stroke, ischemic heart disease, and COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, are the most common uh, reasons, causes of death in all of the, most of these countries. And then if you expand beyond to other Asian countries, again, you'll see stroke, ischemic heart disease, COPD, kind of repeated. So while there's a lot of chronic conditions and there's a lot of heterogeneity in the group of people we're talking about, there are certain things that are common in amongst um, within this group of folks. Managing these conditions, chronic conditions is really complicated. It often requires adherence to medications, taking medicines on time, often multiple medications, especially if you're managing more than one condition. A lot of times there are exercise recommendations. Uh, sometimes they are tailored to the health condition. Sometimes they are about uh, the minimum number of minimum exercise you should be doing. Sometimes it could be maximum as well. There's often dietary recommendations, could be low salt diet, low sugar diet, certainly things like having more vegetables and fruit is something that we hear repeatedly. An important aspect of self-management of chronic conditions is monitoring certain symptoms. So these could be things like shortness of breath uh, or uh, watching if your weight is uh, increasing very rapidly, watching your fluid intake if it's diet. These type of monitoring symptoms is a critical aspect of many chronic conditions because it also involves knowing when you can manage it on your own and what knowing when you need to call uh, an advice line or go to the emergency room. Preventive care is an important aspect of chronic illnesses, and this could be any things like taking the flu shot, now of course the COVID vaccination. So managing all these multiple things can be a very complicated thing. And in fact, um, by not managing these properly, it, we, it can lead to worsening health and lowering the well-being of the person who is managing these health conditions. In addition, because these are so complex and very hard to manage sometimes and remember all the different things, it can also increase the risk of depression for if you have too many health conditions that you're managing. And that is where caregivers come in. Caregivers are family members and friends who care for somebody with a medical or mental health condition. And in the US, there are 53 million adults who identify as caregivers according to national data. What is striking is uh, most of the time people are not paid to provide this care. So if you think a husband and a wife or a you know, son caring for a father, these are not positions that people get paid to do. But if you, take the, uh, if you take the amount of unpaid care that is provided in the United States each year, it is, it is estimated to be about $500 billion. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a really large number for me and I cannot wrap my head around it. So I will try to anchor it with the top, with some of these very familiar multinational companies. And these are the market caps of these companies. So as you can see, the unpaid services provided by caregiving exceeds the market cap of three Fortune uh, 100 companies. So basically if caregiving was an industry we, or, or a company, it would be a Fortune 100 company. These are some important statistics of what caregiving in the United States looks like. And again, this is not Asian specific, this is generally in the country. Um, these are reports that are put out every five years by AARP and National Alliance of Caregiver, uh, Caregiving. And you can see that in the top left over here, the number of caregivers between 2015 has increased by about 10 million by 2020. Now, it's important to remember that this report actually reflects pre-pandemic data because it's the report that came out in 2020, but the data were collected in uh, between 2016, 2017, 2018. Um, so these numbers, can, it will be very interesting to see the 2025 report to see how much of that shifted because of the pandemic. What's striking is more Americans are caring for more than one person, so it went from 18 to 24%. If from one in five, it's now one in four people have difficulty coordinating care. There's more people caring for Alzheimer's disease or dementia, and more family caregivers are reporting that their own health is poor. So not while they're caring for somebody else, their own health is getting worse. Um, caregiving can be a very gendered situation. Um, in this, as you can see, 61% of uh, caregivers are women. But of course, that means 39% are men. So really caregiving is something that is an everybody issue. 
And then about half report that being a caregiver has had at least one financial impact. And uh, six in 10, about three in five report that it's had an impact on the work environment. But caregivers are really critical to self-management. Caregivers like husbands, wives, for, um, uh, sisters, daughters-in-law, daughters, sons, you name it. They play multiple roles. And what we know from a few decades of research is that caregivers who, people who have caregivers involved have generally better outcomes than those who don't. Caregivers provide emotional support, so help with coping um, with the patient who might be struggling and help with stress management. They provide what's called instrumental or practical support, so they help prepare meals, pick up medication, all the way to taking care of things uh, that are called act activities of daily living, like take, helping somebody take a bath or uh, mobi assisting with mobility. Increasingly, we are expecting the caregivers to uh, take on really complicated medical tasks. Uh, this could be things like wound care, so dressing changes, or giving injections at home to patients. These are usually tasks that previously were taken care of by nurses or nursing aides, and now we're expecting uh, caregivers to take on this task. And then caregivers are very critical to care coordination, for example, understanding discharge instructions. This is a lot that uh, caregivers are expected to do. So it's probably not surprising that it comes at a great emotional and financial cost. On average, caregivers pay about $7,000 out of the pocket every year to care for the care recipient. And these are, could be you know, picking up groceries, helping pay for medicine, uh, gas money to drive to appointments and uh, helping with rent, anything. And the emotional toll taken by caregiving actually increases with the amount of time people provide care, as well as the intensity of care provided. And then finally, caregivers also take on patient advocacy. So taking on representing the voice of the patients in the healthcare decision-making. In the same report that I mentioned earlier with the National Alliance of Caregiving, they actually looked at the characteristics of Asian caregivers. And again, we all know on this call that that's a very diverse group, but these are the data that we have. <clears throat> on average, the uh, average caregiver who identifies as Asian is about 49 years old, and they care typically for a parent or a parent-in-law. About half live with the care recipient, and the care recipients are often are about, about approximately 70 years of age and have about two health conditions. What's striking is that they provide 24 plus hours of care each week. That is a half, more than a half-time job. So in addition to working about a full-time job, which is the next bullet point, our caregivers, Asian caregivers are providing another uh, 20 hour, 24 hours of care. So they're basically doing a job and a half when there are caregivers. Compared to other racial and ethnic groups in the United States, Asian caregivers actually report uh, way higher emotional uh, distress. And strikingly, majority feel that they had no choice in taking care of their, taking on their caregiving responsibility. They felt that they were expected because of their relationship um, and the cultural norms that they had to take on these different caregiving responsibilities, responsibility, they didn't have a choice. And they also expect to be a caregiver for someone else, so another person in the next five years. So while Asian culture is very diverse, there are certain commonalities that uh, manifest in this caregiving world. A, an important part is that Asians are collectivists, meaning that the cultural norms are that the group is prioritized over the individuals. And so uh, people are expected to take care of other people and think about the, what's best for the family, what's best for the community, rather than your own individual needs. And within that, the motivations and expectations are culturally embedded. What, you know, so why people are caring for them for each other is because it's expected that if you're a daughter-in-law, you'll be caring for your father-in-law and your mother-in-law. There's it is not something that is there's much choice that is given in that. And the expectations could be that the son is actually taking care of the financial pieces, whereas the daughter-in-law takes care of all the other household chores. And this type of, uh, there's a lot more intergenerational care that occurs in Asian, uh, in Asian cultures because uh, kids and youth often get engaged because grandparents are living, are cohabitating and the families are multi-generational. So there's a lot of intergenerational caregiving that occurs. 
we saw in the United States that about 61% of caregivers are women. So women are generally caregivers and across all cultures, but there are very uh, um, rigidly defined gender roles that make a difference when it comes to caregiving out in the Asian countries. Unfortunately, we don't have really nice national data as like we do in the United States and Europe and Australia. But, in, but there's an estimate that in India, 80% of caregivers of middle-aged um, people, or sorry, not middle-aged, people who are 60 and above, 80% of those caregivers are women. So uh, uh, eight out of every 10 are women. And often these are daughters-in-law, not daughters. There's also some concepts that in caregiving that are important to think about. So for example, in some of the Indian culture, especially in Hinduism and Sikhism and other religions, there's this concept of seva. And seva, the concept is really translated into service. But in this case, the idea is that service to another person who is in need is the same as serving God. So it's considered a spiritual uh, experience or a spiritual practice. And the way it's, uh, when it works, it makes people feel less guilty that they're not devoting their time to uh, prayer or meditation or other re religious practices. But as you can imagine, when, we, when you're told that this is something that you should feel good about, but you're actually feeling stressed and burned out, people don't feel that they have an avenue to share these negative experiences. And of course, we're all familiar with health literacy and language barriers as in the healthcare system, because we don't have uh, materials that are in, in Asian languages and they're not culturally concordant. And finally, help seeking behavior also varies. So Asian Americans are less likely to seek professional help when they are in, under stress. They're less likely to tell their doctors or get help from a mental health professional. Um, and they are, so they do need help with managing uh, emotional, physical stress, but other things that people in uh, our people in Asian cultures often are looking for is finding a home care agency or residential facility, especially one that can speak the language or has the culture of the person that is being placed in the settings. Pardon me. Um, I mentioned that the uh, caregivers in the United States are experiencing significant stress. And this is likely the same in Asian cultures as well. And while we don't have, as I mentioned, nice national data, there have been a few studies and this particular study uh, looked at caregivers in India. And they found that uh, two out of every three caregivers spend more than 10 hours per day caring for their patient. More than 50% reported depression. So more than half reported that they were feeling depressed and they were more likely to report depression if they were caring for a spouse, if they were living with the patient, so they, I guess they, wasn't, they weren't getting a break, if they were responsible for household chores, money and transportation, and provided more than 10 hours of care per day. Uh, and in this particular study, it was striking because everyone reported stress. So 18% reported severe stress, but uh, everybody's reported at least moderate stress. But I don't want people to feel, you know, that it's all gloom and doom. People do experience significant joys of caregiving. And I think it's important for us to recognize that there's all of these activities, there's ways in which we can bring about joy. Um, in one study, uh, they found that 83%, so that's a pretty sizable number, eight out of every 10 caregiver experienced some positive aspects of caregiving. And it's been documented that if you're a partner, if you're a wife or a husband or a girlfriend or boyfriend, you are more likely to feel uh, caregiving joy compared to other relationships. So uh, compared to like if you were a child caring for a parent. What are some sources of positive effects? Uh, people feel that they, they feel a reward of helping someone in need. They feel that they're doing the right thing by helping somebody in need. Um, caregivers report that they feel the positive aspects of growing. They feel that they're growing in the role. They're able to take on more responsibilities. And a lot of caregivers engage in what is known as benefit finding. So they think, what is the benefit of this uh, challenging situation I'm going through? And people say that they feel they get more time with a loved one. They feel that there's more meaning and purpose in their lives because they're being 
they're contributing to somebody's uh, life. And a lot of them say that they feel good because they feel that they're modeling for the next generation how you should care for each other. To me, this is a very personal aspect. So this is not something that is just a hypothetical for me. These are my parents. Um, my dad has, a, so we grew up in India and my dad, um, like many people from South Asian countries has long history of early onset of a heart disease. And my mom is a breast cancer survivor. Uh, she's uh, taken uh, for over 10 years, over 15 years of that, she's had metastatic breast cancer. And I've seen firsthand how in our, in our families, not only are they caring for each other with each other's health conditions, but how so many family members and friends have stepped in to help out during the most acute phases of this disease management and how people really focus on the person who is in need of help. And I think it's very important to recognize that, that these are real stories that we are talking about. But I've also seen when there's been, when things have become challenging, where one of them feels like they're got, kind of gotten to the point where it's been so stressful that they need a break. And, and they, we've been very fortunate that there's a lot of people involved, but we know that that's not always the case. So my goal is to effect, eventually develop a culturally attuned family-centered healthcare system to support patients with chronic and serious illnesses. And I'm going to share some, some of our own research, research um, uh, at a very high level, and I'm happy to answer questions about this too, just to sort of highlight um, these important issues. So this study is called Suffered. Suffered means succeed in Gujarati, which is my mother tongue. And it stands for South Asian Family Approaches to Diseases. And the idea behind the study is that I mentioned, you know, I mentioned my family history and I really wanted, uh, when I started digging, I realized that there's actually very, very little research on uh, family caregiving in South Asian countries or in Asian countries in general. So our goal was to first, and even the experiences were not understood. So what we wanted to understand the experiences of South Asian survivors of breast cancer, as well as their family members and friends, so their caregivers. We also wanted to talk with providers to see what can the health care system do to address the cultural needs of South Asians managing breast cancer. And our eventual goal is to develop programs that can address these unmet needs. This is our website. Um, so we've completed phase one of interviewing and I'll share some data on or share some results from that. Uh, but you're welcome to go check it out at Suffered Studies sites or you can get the QR code or just email me and I'm happy to um, direct you that way. So what we did was we interviewed 13 survivors and 13 caregivers. Uh, survivors had had breast cancer for um, on average about five years. Um, and people were, and survivors and caregivers were in their 40s. So they were on the younger side. And what we did was with, we interviewed them and we, they participated in about an hour long interviews as well as complete surveys. And these are just some of the findings that um, resonated that we saw across these interviews. First, we found that survivors and caregivers really wanted to connect with other South Asian survivors and caregivers. Um, cancer is a very stigmatized condition in South Asian culture. So when cancer is diagnosed, it could, becomes very isolating. So they felt that, well, who would really understand or who they really could talk to is people like them. We also found that survivors and caregivers had high trust in medical teams. However, caregivers did feel that the healthcare teams were not engaging with them as much as they could have. Um, both survivors and caregivers said that they wanted culturally concordant lifestyle recommendations for managing cancer. So for example, um, they wanted to know what are some things that they could do to prevent recurrence of cancer? Or now that they've had cancer, uh, what is it that they can do to improve their prognosis? And the challenging part of, um, the challenging part of this is Actually, uh, when we spot to talk with oncologists, there aren't really any lifestyle recommendations once you develop cancer. There are ways, there are things you can do to prevent cancer, exercising, keeping your body fat down, um, not smoking cigarettes, alcohol, uh, limited alcohol use. But once you have cancer, there are no recommendations. But the South Asian families really wanted to know 
what, what, what kind of meals should they prepare? What kind of food should they eat? Um, and they didn't really get any answers. Um, caregivers noted that they were caring for many individuals, not just the person who had uh, breast cancer. And they this, did say that they received a lot of emotional support, but what they really wanted was practical support. They really wanted somebody to help with meals. They wanted somebody to take the kids to school. You know, they wanted somebody to take the patient to the med to the different appointments. And then finally, and now this will probably not come as a surprise to anybody on this call, um, that people really didn't find uh, culturally concordant any tools or materials, educational materials um, that could help them in their own languages. We also asked the uh, we also asked our participants, what are some things you need to take care of yourself? We were really curious. And this was just a narrative that they provided. So what we did was we put these answers together in a word cloud. And as you can see, what they really wanted were friends and positive people and support system family. So what they really, really wanted was to connect with other people. That was their top, uh, top needs. And when you ask the same question of caregivers, they kind of said the same thing, but what they really wanted was practical support. They felt that they were they wanted emotional support, they were getting other things, but what they wanted was mainly practical support and some family. And then of course, this is, we hear this from caregiving research all the time, is they want just more time. They want time for themselves. They want time to um, just navigate everything. Um, I, you know, somebody hears that alcohol, one of the patients said wine, which, you know, fair enough. The other thing that we wanted to do, and this is something I think that uh, what we're hoping to do with this is to make it into a tool that we can use clinically, is to adapt these tools called um, Atlas Care Maps. And these were developed by Raj, who is a, our advisory board member, and uh, we've collaborated for a while. And he has developed these Atlas Care Maps to, re to visually represent people's care networks. Um, and we've been working with him to adapt it so that it can be, uh, it can add different pieces that also are useful clinically so that healthcare te uh, teams can use it. So I'm not gonna, so we did this, what we did was we interviewed all of our participants and we developed, based on the interviews, we developed the care maps with targeted questions. And I'll give you just an example of a survivor one and a caregiver one. And it's, it's a way for uh, us to visualize and for the participants to visualize what's existing in their network and what could be missing. So here's a survivor example. So this is a woman uh, who's a breast cancer survivor. She lives uh, in the house. These concentric circles represent geographical distance. So the closer, the darker gray means that people are living in the same um, city. The lighter gray is a different state. And then if you go beyond that, then it's, they're outside of the United States. So she lives with her husband and she actually provides care to him even as she he's caring for her. And he helps, these are different icons we've developed, but he helps, he prepares meals, he helps, does some research, he takes her to the medical appointment. She, the blue arrows going towards the survivor, to, uh, towards the person indicates the care that they are getting. So she gets support from, uh, from her workplace, but it's kind of intermittent, it kind of comes and goes. She has a brother who lives um, uh, in the, close by who she provides support to he by talking, but he helps her mainly by doing some research, but really taking care of their parents. She has a nutritional therapist who kind of helps take care of some of her nutritional needs. She has some close friends who help out, who provide some emotional support, kind of helping with stress. She has her healthcare team. She also has a, a boss who is a breast cancer survivor and some coworkers who also uh, provide some care support to her. But she also supports her brother's kids. You know, she provides, she's kind of talks with them and sort of helps them kind of get through their lifestyle. Um, but that's not all. She also supports her sister-in-law a brother who she FaceTimes with, a mother who she supports who lives back in India, and a, and a dad who um, she feels like she supports, but she also gets some support from her. So you can see that in this one person's network, 
there is just so much richness that does not get captured when we go to a clinic appointment. But if you can imagine that if you were to take something like this to your clinic appointment, then it would make a lot of sense for the care team to go, oh, this is what's going on in your life. These are a lot of people involved. So it's not just one or two people that we're talking about. So what we found that across the different uh, survivors, <clears throat> that on average, the number of people the survivors supported were about four. So they actually supported four people and received support about 14 different people. So they were pretty rich and complex networks. Um, those who had earlier stage uh, cancers were more had were um, provided care to about four people, and that number dropped to about two people later in the uh, late, in the later stages. And the survivors, uh, compared to survivors who were less than forty, those who were fifty and above, were more likely to seek support from individuals outside the U.S. Okay, so now this is a caregiver. Again, I'm just going to show an example. I think uh, maybe you can follow along better now. So this is now the caregiver, the husband. Same two circles, concentric circles. This is the wife. This, this is the same. So this is the same diet couple that I'm talking about, by the way. So you can see there's also going to be some differences in what they feel that they each do. Um, they're caring for each other. We saw that. He gets, he gets some support from an aunt who's a breast cancer survivor who also shares some medical tasks. I mean, medical information. And she ha and he has found his brother-in-law's colleague who's a breast cancer survivor, who he also talks to and gets um, some statistics from and gets some information. Um, uh, she, he speaks with the brother-in-law. This is the wife's brother we saw in the earlier care map. And then there's another brother-in-law that he also talks to. So this is from his side, his sister's brother, uh, sister's husband. He has his own care team as well. So you can see that compared to the survivor, his network is quite sparse um, and he's only caring for the wife and nobody else. So on average, for caregivers, they reported that they had about nine people in their care network. Um, they supported about four people and they felt that about eight people supported them. So a little less, receive, receive a little less support than survivors felt. Also, uh, we found that for caregivers, most of uh, more than half of their care networks were composed of family members. Um, and only three caregivers reported that they felt supported by the care team. So these, you know, these sort of represent that our collectivism that is so inherent in the Asian culture is actually deeply embedded in how people come together when they're caring for somebody with a chronic or serious illness. So to summarize, and I see there's uh, the chat is active, so I'm guessing there's some questions coming in. So I just want to summarize by saying Asians represent a large diverse group with, with some common values whose caregiving networks include mainly family members and caregiving is often provided by women, although as you saw in the data I presented, um, men are also often providing care as well. And intergenerational care is very valued. I just want to put in a plug that Caregiving, as with other aspects, it remains vastly understudied amongst our communities. So if you see opportunities to volunteer for research, please consider joining them. And we, sh we should know that caregivers experience both joy and stress in their roles. I'm going to just share of some strategies that would, you know, if, you're, if you are a caregiver or if you see a caregiver, some strategies that could help. And I'm happy to expand on this some more. Um, uh, so a couple of the pointers I have is wanting to take breaks is normal, so don't feel guilty. If you feel like you've had enough, uh, you need a break from providing care, that's an absolutely normal part of the experience, and um, it's helpful to talk about it. Um, it's important whenever possible to communicate your needs and boundaries with the care recipient, so whoever you're caring for, to let them know when you need a break, what are the things that you're comfortable doing and not comfortable doing, which are very complicated and difficult conversation. When possible, you should create a schedule that allows you to take, uh, to take breaks and don't hesitate to get help from other family members, friends, or even nursing aides or home health aides who can help uh, take care of some of the things at home. Um, this can be challenging at times, but focus on strategies to increase joy which include finding meaning in the work you're doing, 
finding humor um, and then doing things with the care recipient that you enjoy. And this could be things like going for a walk, watching movie, watching TV, playing games. Um, it depends on how much the care recipient is, um, how mobile they are and what they're willing to do. A lot of people find it beneficial if they talk with other caregivers or if they join a support group. And then finally, please always consider talking to your primary care provider, a mental health professional, if you start feeling depressed, stressed, or burned out. These are some resources that um, are, are really good to look into if you are a caregiver yourself. Um, there's National Alliance of Caregivers. Uh, there's VA Caregiver Support, which is, um, it's not just VA uh, specific. And if you are uh, specific to caregiving in India, the Caregiver Sathi group in India is a really terrific resource as well. So I just wanna end with this quotation. There are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be, will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. So with that, I'm gonna just put up my contact information and turn it back over to uh, Mino. Thank you so much for this uh, important information. And uh, chronic illnesses are, in, are increasing, uh, but also managing the condition is becoming more and more difficult. Um, uh, very important information as caregiving is joyful and also is, can be stressful. And so um, while we're taking care of, uh, of others, it's very important to also so, see how we can take care of ourselves. So thank you for sharing that information. There are some questions uh, which, are, uh, which are submitted and I'll go over the questions so they can uh, answer them. Uh, there was the first question which was in the chat was, is there a hotel or apartment for short-term stay that hospice patients can go and stay for short-term besides their homes? There are respite care places. Um, I don't know if there's a there's a hotels. Um, there are places that you can do respite care and overnight care. Um, I don't know how to uh, get the information. Uh, but, but the Sukham group actually is a good place to start, or maybe you can uh, look into um, a Stanford might have some resources around that. I, you know, these are there's area uh, services that serve those that those communities or, or those needs. Um, a lot of times, the respite care is also available for people to come to your house so that you can get respite. So sometimes the patient themselves are not able to leave the home or don't want to leave the home, but they still need um, care and they need uh, supervision. But people people can come in and have um, get respite from that too. Thank you. Uh, the next question was: Are there nursing aides of Indian company aware of uh, that can help provide care? Um, I don't know if there's entire companies. I think uh, the few resources, again, that come to mind are Sukham is a good resource to check out. Um, there's also Aging 101 that is run by Dr. Rita Ghatak. She probably has a lot of, um, her organization probably has a lot of those connections because that's what a big part of what they do is they help with, uh, their focus is dementia caregiving, but a lot of the things applies to all kinds of caregiving. Um, so they might have more of the lists of, of people who are um, who are have the Indian descent. Uh, Rita Gatak, G-H-A-T-A-K, and it's Aging 101 is, I think, the name of the company, uh, her company. I also just want to say that uh, the Stanford, uh, Stanford has an off, uh, not office, uh, Stanford Caregiver Initiative um, and they have a Stanford resource um, in uh, 500P, 500 Pasture Drive. They have a play, a library. Maybe somebody who's, maybe Jillian or somebody who's more familiar with it can speak to that. But they have really great library resources in that place. And um, there might be other resources that you, uh, you if you're connected to Stanford, if your patients are, if you're a Stanford patient or your patient is a Stanford patient, you might have access to that too. And I think Nina, you, just, um, Nina, Nina sure. just put a health library resource. Thank you. It's called the Stanford Caregiver Center. Thank you. 
And uh, they were asking the if you could repeat the doctor's name again. Yeah, I'll put it in chat. Okay. Um, I'll put it in everyone. Um, but... And then we have some pre-submitted questions. Um, how should one approach caretaker burnout when your loved ones are in need? Um, this is a very, very common issue because the caregivers need, care recipients needs often only increase. There, it's very, um, it's, you know, there's a lot of conditions, things either are stable or are just generally deteriorating. So once you, uh, ideally we would recognize that uh, we would do a lot more things to prevent burnout, like taking breaks, finding other resources, um, all those things, which always sound far easier to say than actually to do, especially if you're the one person who's able, who the care recipient trusts, or if the care recipient doesn't speak English, for example, and they need somebody to constantly translate. If you start experiencing caregiver burnout, um, it's very, very important that you get the help that you need. So whether it's a support group, whether it's uh, talking to a mental health professional, somebody who has an expertise in caregiver, uh, uh, a burnout would be ideal, but also talk with the care recipients healthcare team. So your loved one's care team and say, and let them know that you're struggling, that this is that, and it's nothing to feel bad about. It does not mean you love that person any less. These are really, really difficult situations. And what happens is that we more and more keeps getting added. And um, if you're lucky enough to have a case manager, a social worker as part of the care team, they can really help you figure out other resources like, like home health aid or nursing aids, or um, there's also people, you can get stipends through some of the federal and state um, um, policies, like a Medicare, Medicaid to care for somebody, care for a family member. So there's ways that you can get additional help that could help out. But the most important thing is if you're already starting to feel burned out, uh, talk with your doctor and talk with the care recipients care team, your loved one's care team, and let them know. And maybe, and they will, A, will have heard this before already, and then may, and hopefully they'll be, have some solutions for, the, for you. Another question is, um, is there any research on how Asian American family members and patients perceive palliative, palliative care in hospital settings, this is from a clinician and a professional interpreter, and um, she and she finds that in business model and the, the way they are trained make it such that the medical professionals tend not to respond in a way that addresses their needs, particularly when it com comes to being emotionally responsive. So again, the question is, is there any research on how Asian American family members and patients perceive palliative care in hospital settings? Hmm. That's where that's what we are doing. <laughs> so our the the project was actually funded by Palliative Care Foundation. Uh, not a lot, and not as not as much. I I can speak to more to the South Asian literature. Um, there's a lot of services that uh, people are that are pr present, but in general, palliative care, hospice care, end of life care, pain management. Those are things that are not really well studied. Um, the research that um, my colleague Carl Lorenz is doing in, and Carlene Gianna Trapani, they're doing, that is based in India, they're doing more training palliative care, um, uh, palliative care providers, training people to provide palliative care in India and working with the Pallium group, which is Dr. Rajagopal's um, group in uh, Kerala to work with them. But the research is, very, very limited in the in these uh, things because again, these are very taboo conditions. And as actually we have, I didn't I did not report our provider interviews, but we were talking, we interviewed providers about this and asked about how they feel providing culturally attuned care to South Asian um, patients. And one of the things that they brought up is actually it's it gets complicated when, the families don't want to disclose that some like serious diagnosis like cancer to the patient. And 
of course the provider healthcare provider is like, well, we have to disclose, like that's that's how we provide care. Or if they say, well, no, 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 the, the patient is asking for pain medicine. Um, and the family says, no, no, we want them alert. And, you know, you know, this is not, we don't want them to have uh, opioid pain medicine because it can be addictive. And so providers actually really find themselves caught in the middle of these conversations. Mm -hmm. um, and again, in the palliative realm. So these are, these are really questions that need to be um, well stated, well understood. And if the person who asked that question is interested in collaborating, please reach out to me. There's, a, there's enough work to go around. These are big problems we need to address. Absolutely. Next question is, what strategies are there that clinical teams can implement to better include caregivers into the clinical care, especially when there are nine plus caregivers involved? Sorry, can you repeat that question? I was yeah. I got distracted by the chat. Uh, <laughs> what strategies are there that clinical teams can implement to better mm -hmm. include caregivers Mm -hmm. clinical care, especially when there is a big number of caregivers uh, which is involved. Yeah, the, there's, I think these are really, uh, this is kind of goes toward the vision of culturally attuned care. I think that the important, first thing is to find out who does the patient want to be involved, mm -hmm. right? Because I think when we keep the patient front and center, that can be really helpful from a clinical perspective. Uh, and that question has to be asked in private obviously, because the patient, this is patient's families and these get complicated. Then we need, you need to make sure that the person who the patient has appointed, anointed, that that person knows that they're the main person. Um, and then the this different discussion need to flow through that. Uh, and then there might need to be, you might need to work with a case manager or somebody with that specialty to work out some kind of communication plan. Like, so what are the needs of these eight people? Is that they want to be involved with every aspect? They want the information, they want to do all that. And I think that's, well, it will take a lot of effort and resources, but I think to provide truly patient-centered, family-centered care, that's an effort that we as clinicians, unfortunately, will have to shift our paradigm to do it. But the advantage of that is that the patients feels like their needs are being taken care of. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the, uh, and then they, once there's a point caregiver, then it can be that person's responsibility to communicate with the other people and channel the communication to the healthcare team. Perfect. Uh, another question just came in. Uh, any resources or insights relating to younger Asian American adults with chronic and serious illnesses? Um, they and their caregivers, middle and older adults may face particular stresses, especially disruption in expected roles. Mm. I think I see what you're getting at. So the older person is caring for the younger person. Correct. And so now it's kind of flipping that intergenerational care. Yeah. Um, I think this is, there's a lot of research in this in not specific to Asians, but, and I'm not familiar with this particular dimension of research, but outside of the Asian culture, just generally, there's a fair bit of culture, parents caring for kids. Uh, kids with chronic conditions like diabetes or developmental disabilities, um, uh, congenital dis diseases, cancer. And I, so there is a fair bit of research out there. A lot of these are kind of, are not well researched, but I would say if you are somebody in that position where you are experiencing that, um, you're experiencing that sort of shift in script, it's, I would say, recognize it as a kind of grieving, right? So it is a kind of grief that we experience when we, you know, when we see our next generation not uh, not uh, thriving the way we had imagined, and it's absolutely reasonable to then seek talk with somebody, talk with a psychologist, to help get somebody to help you process what that looks like. Talk with other parents who are in a similar situation, even if it's not the same condition, mm -hmm. because parents often feel that that they feel that this is not. This is not how it should be, uh, exactly. whether it's because they felt like who's going to take care of me because we thought that's what the kids would do. Sometimes the kids uh, wind up dying before the parents. And mm -hmm. that also seems, you know, uh, like you're flipping the script and that's not how the order of the world should be. Um, so and many times I feel there is uh, some discomfort when it comes to 
uh, if the younger uh, you know person is is sick and the if the parent has to take care of the younger person that um i think so the transparency probably doesn't happen as much because the younger person is probably feeling should i be telling my dad or mom to take care of me or the elders to take care of me and i think so that becomes difficult yes absolutely um there is uh, another question I encounter issues related to the family members not wanting to disclose the cancer or any terminal illness diagnosis due to cultural beliefs and medical professionals not understanding that. I would love to be able to help in any way with getting involved in the research related to palliative care and sharing my own experience and observations as a clinician and professional interpreter in palliative care. So, yeah. Uh, um uh, I think that's Sonia. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just email me at ronicht at stanford.edu and uh, we can, we can uh, and tell me a little bit more about your background and we can take it from there. Happy to talk more. Perfect. Those are the questions I have so far. Um, I have one more question, which I have um, from the, from the questions which were submitted earlier. And um, how can we best support caregivers and understand their challenges without framing those people in need of care as burdensome? Um, the way we have approached it in our work is basically talk about that any chronic illness affects the patients and caregivers both, but in different ways. So it may affect the patient in the way of you know, changing their quality of life. Maybe they might not be able to do as many things as they used to. They're more worried, they had to change their lifestyle, but that the caregiver is affected as well. So it's not so much that the care, the care recipient or the patient is deliberately making it harder on the caregiver. It's that they're both affected. It's a stressor. It's something that is a stressful situation that is affecting more than one person. Uh, and I think keeping that framing can be really helpful to, to for the patients to not feel guilty because a lot of times patients feel guilty. They feel that, gosh, you know, if it wasn't for me, you would you would have so much more time. We'd have so much more money. You know, if my mm -hmm. health wasn't like this, you wouldn't have to quit your job. Um, and I think these are really these are tough co conversations. One of the things we've been doing is working on we've developed an intervention that gets patients and caregivers to have these conversations, to get them to sort of see each other's uh, perspectives and be able to communicate without, and so that they it actually can serve to strengthen their relationship. So these are all opportunities also to strengthen the uh, relationship. And I think the other part, the burdensome thing is, I think um, we also need to recognize that just because somebody is sick, even very, very sick, doesn't mean that they, don't have value or that they can't contribute, mm -hmm. right? And so I think there's this sort of idea that, um, like an ableist idea, that if you're disabled, that you're not, your worth has dropped. Mm -hmm. And I think that is very pervasive, unfortunately, in our society. So I think that that becomes more of, you know, I think where we as a society need to shift our perspective to think about people as not just, um, in terms of their ability to earn money or do their physical ability, but also to continue um, uh, appreciating what they have to offer and then creating a, creating a place where they feel like they can contribute. So they don't themselves feel like they're a burden to a person or to their communities. Perfect, thank you. Um, thank you for all the great answers, uh, Ranak. And I don't see any other questions coming in, but um, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, if there is anything else which you would like to share with our uh, with our audience, feel free. Um, but those were kind of the questions which I had on the chat. No, um, I can, I think this is, because this is recorded and people have access to it, but if somebody is looking for a specific resource that, that I put up and you missed that slide, or if you need, way to contact just just email me um, I'm happy to uh, send those send those uh, resources your way thank you so much for all uh, what you do uh, and thank you for 
thank you for this excellent presentation and uh, and have a good evening everybody uh, take care thank you for moderating Mano. okay take care have a good night okay have a good night